the organizers of the workshop, along with John Pollock and the Kissack Center and Jerry Singerman, humanities editor emeritus at Penn Press, and of course, Lila Goldenberg, who will be introduced in a second. Um, but I, I want to thank Nell also for stepping into the breach of, of running our Zoom um, while Lila's up in front. We can't make her do everything at once. Um, but it's always, this is always a great occasion, I think, each year when the Bristol Schoenberg Fellow presents to this group. Um, Lila Goldenberg has, of course, made the workshop run this entire year, uh, and we're all really grateful to her. Um, but we're looking forward to hearing about her scholarship uh, in a few minutes. And I can also announce today that after Lila's term as the fellow ends, um, next year's fellow will be Peter Diamond. So please come in and congratulating him. Uh, welcome to all the emails, phone calls, budget spreadsheets, <laughs> dinner reservations, and all of that. Um, Lila's done a terrific job this year, and we're looking forward to congratulating her on a dissertation defense next year. Um, so as you know, Lila is a PhD candidate in the history department here. She received her BA from Cornell in history and classics and her MA from Columbia in medieval and Renaissance studies. And I, I didn't realize this until today as I was looking, looking you up, but the, her master's thesis has a really delightful title, which is New York, Columbia University, Rare Book and Manuscript Library, XO96.C286. <laughs> Really? Only the people <laughs> in this room could love that title. <laughs> um, her dissertation in progress is called By Hand and Press, 16th and 17th century hybrid books from England, France, and the Netherlands. But I think probably you need to get a shelf mark in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to, of course, the high honor of the Bristol Schoenberg Fellowship, uh, Lila was a Bradley Research Fellow in 2021-22. And she's just received news of a dissertation Completion Fellowship for next year. Congratulations. <laughs> so you all know her already, but please join me in welcoming her to the front of the room, to the high table, uh, yeah. instead of that seat, um, to talk to us about library catalogs in 17th century Oxford. Okay. So hello, I tried to think of an eclipse joke, but I couldn't, so I apologize. <laughs> um, but first I'd like to thank Zach and Jerry and John for giving me the opportunity to talk here tonight and for letting me serve as the Bristol Schoenberg Fellow. It's been a really wonderful, lovely experience and I've learned a lot and thank you for your mentorship. I'd also like to thank my committee members, um, Ada Kutkowski, Margot Todd, Rachel Chapier, and then Dr. Kutsky, who can't be here tonight, but thank you all for your guidance and support, both past and future support, and my dissertation wouldn't be where it is without you. Um, you got it. Okay, yes. She's Sorry, I'm trying to be yeah, the Brazil yeah. Schoenberg <laughs> Fellow and also be the speaker. Um, but thank you all for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. So today I would like to share with you some of the work in my dissertation on hybrid books, which are books that contain both manuscript and printed components. And I argue that we need to dismantle the fiction that there was a stark demarcation from the age of medieval manuscripts to the age of early modern printed books. And that this is a false statement that handwritten illuminated books on parchment were ceded to the inexpensive printed books on paper during the early modern period. So many historians like McKittrick and Knight have already complicated this narrative, but I would like to put forward my own intervention, which is that the hybrid book stands in the balance between these two categories, neither completely manuscript nor completely printed. And there are many ways to combine manuscript and print, creating a vast array of categories of things which can be classified as hybrid books. But the ones that I am interested in were customized by their owners. 
and by analyzing their materiality, a picture emerges of the intimate relationship between a reader grappling with and benefiting from the coexistence of the two media in her own book. Okay. So my dissertation discusses three aspects of early modern owners and their hybrid books. And I explore how 16th century Dutch nuns created a liturgical collage of medieval manuscripts, a newly printed Psalter, and the women's own annotations to create an idiosyncratic religious experience. And I also analyzed how 16th century French people made devotional books with print elements that mimicked manuscripts and manuscript elements which mm -hmm. mimicked print. Blurring the two lines between these two media, but today I'm here to discuss another facet of my work, which is how hybrid books enable people to study theology and intertextual reading. And a prime example of this is 17th century um, binders blanks, which are blank pages inserted between every printed page in catalogs at the Bodleian, which is Oxford Central University Library. So here I have up here an example of a library catalog with binders blanks. And the printed side is on the right, and the blank with manuscript annotations is on the left, and together they form a hybrid book. Although the content of each catalog with binders blanks was idiosyncratic to each assembler, they can be divided into three genres or classifications. The first is for librarians to draft printed catalogs. The second is for patrons to customize their printed catalogs. And the third is for institutions to update their catalogs to keep track of books as they entered into the collection. In 1635, a Bodleian librarian, Jean Vernoy, composed a printed catalog to help patrons sort through the massive collection of books at Oxford, which he called nomenclator of such tracts and sermons as have been printed or translated into English upon any place or book of Holy Scripture. And the Romans used the term nomenclator to refer to slaves who recall lists of names and whispered them into the ears of their forgetful masters. And I feel like that's something that interns in Washington probably still do today. Um, the evolution of nomenclator into a bibliographic form is appropriate because these library catalogs also helped an ignorant person sort through a vast number of names, and in this case, their authors. Nomenclator was a landmark catalog because it aided readers in finding sources based on passages in the Bible, and no other catalog had done this before. And I'm going to show you how Binders Blanks played a pivotal role in both the production of and use of nomenclator. So before we discuss nomenclator's importance, we must discuss the catalogs that came before it. Nomenclator's importance does not lie in being Oxford's first catalog. In fact, there were two earlier ones published in 1605 and 1620 by the institution's first librarian, Thomas James. However, these could not satisfy a patron's every needs. The catalog organized books by the first letter of the author's name, but was not helpful beyond that. So as you see here, here are the A's. As you can see on the left, anonymous comes before on the right, Alcoran. And that doesn't really make any sense because if it was really alphabetical, Alcoran would come before anonymous. So these books aren't completely helpful. And the books are sorted into the four faculties, which are theology, medicine, law, and arts, which reflect the divisions, the physical divisions at the Bodleian. So right here, this is theology. So these demarcations are very broad, so it's difficult to find books within the catalog. So if you wanted to find a book on Calvinism versus Catholicism, it would be very difficult to find them within theology. So James's catalogs were not perfect, but they were a good start. 
nomenclature solved some of the problems with the 1605 and 1620 catalogs because it sorted theological books and specifically sermons by biblical passage. So here's how it is used. You begin by reading the Bible and then you find a particular passage you're interested in. So you want to know more about Ezekiel 24, which predicts the siege of Jerusalem. So you turn in nomenclature to the section on Ezekiel, and then you find the headline for chapter 24 under that passage. And then under that, you find a sermon that is relevant. So in this case, it's by Samuel Gary, and then it lists the shelf marks. Then you can go and find the book in the library. Because there are so many passages in the Bible and every passage has multiple related sermons, it is impossible to know which sermons were available at the Bodleian and who their authors were without a guide. So nomenclator became an intermediary between the Bible and the reader, allowing him to easily connect verse to sermon. Early modern librarians and institutions like the Bodleian faced a tremendous challenge of information management, and they had to organize an ever-expanding collection of printed material, because before the advent of print, libraries had been smaller because of the expense of manuscripts, and they did not have extensive catalogs aimed at helping readers find books. They only had ledgers which account for books that were in the library. So here we see a late 15th century book inventory from St. Paul's in London, and it's a list of manuscripts that the church owns, but it's not intended to find any particular book in the library. It's to keep track of books as a commodity because books were so expensive. And there are no shelf marks on the list because the library didn't have shelf marks because it wasn't large enough to warrant organization. So it would also be too cumbersome to unroll and re-roll the roll every time you needed to find a specific book. The roll is incredibly long. However, after the advent of print, libraries needed organized catalogs that told the user where to find particular books. Printed books were much more readily available, so libraries grew much larger. And in the case of the Bodleian, the, you know, the library contracted with the stationer's company so that every book published in London would be sent to the Bodleian. So it became incredibly large really quickly. So because the collection is becoming too large to navigate, they printed James's two catalogs in 1605 and 1620. However, as we've seen, James's pioneering resource showcases the limitations of catalogs. Nomenclator's organization of by book of the Bible was monumental. However, the process of sorting through a huge corpus of sermons in the library and arranging them into subcategory by passage is logistically very complicated. So to solve this problem, Vernoy inserted binders blanks in between every page of a 1619 King James Bible. And this transformed the user experience of reading a standard Bible as a devotional experience into a dynamic graph for cataloging. So we have one right here. This is a 1611 King James Bible, and the one I'm looking at is a 1619 King James Bible. But as you can see, it's absolutely enormous. And Vernoy interleaved blanks between every page in the King James Bible to double in size. So he actually had to split it into two books. So just imagine me sitting in the Western room of the Bodleian Library, having these like two massive King James Bibles in front of me. And it's very difficult. But um, so this was his process of drafting to publishing. So he inserted the binders blanks into the Bible, and then he began researching and he read at least 272 sermons, which I know because I counted all 272 and I have a spreadsheet on my computer of <laughs> all of them and how many times he cites different authors. So he cites a lot of people and he read a lot of people. So he would read the sermon. And in this case, on the right side, we see that he read Bartholomew Parsons' marriage sermon, which talks about 
Ruth 4, which is the marriage of Ruth and Boaz. And then he opened to that page in the Bible. So we see on the left, on the printed side, that's the printed text of Ruth 4 in the actual Bible. And then across from the printed page on the blanks, he wrote the name of the author and the shelf mark of the relevant sermon. So here we can see that on the right side that you have Bartholomew Parsons across from Ruth on the left. So the, the reference on the right perfectly mirrors the placement of the printed text on the left. So it's in the exact same place on the column, making it very visually easy to relate the two. So then he just needed to compile a list of all of the sermons in order and then send that to the printer and have the printer publish it. And I'm sure it was a much more complicated process than that, but that's how I imagine he was doing it. But attempting to grab <laughs> such a book as nomenclator using a notebook, which would be the alternative, would be logistically so complicated because you'd need a notebook that was so large and you'd need space for every sermon. And you would need to also have room on your desk to have the sermon and the Bible and your notebook. And that's just too complicated. And so having the blanks interleave in his Bible really streamlined the process and was much more visually easy. So Vernoy chose sermons rather than other sorts of theological works, because unlike church fathers, where the classics, new sermons were being published constantly, and there were too many for a librarian to keep track of if a patron came in asking for a commentary on, say, Proverbs 3, the librarian would have to know all of the sermons on Proverbs 3 to be helpful. So Bosnian librarians were well educated and Vernoy had a master's degree, but even the best education doesn't tell you what the new books in the library are. So you need a published catalog, which is the best way to find books. So a patron doesn't need to rely on an overworked librarian. The authors Vernoy listed on his binders blanks let us see into his personal, personal ideology and that he's a Huguenot, which is a French Calvinist. And Calvinists are a type of Protestant who believe that God already chose who was going to heaven and that humans are inherently corrupt and many other things. Uh, Calvinists were persecuted in, Cal in Catholic countries and often targeted in Protestant ones, including often in England, where the majority of the, Cal the Calvinists were Puritans. And Renoy was born in France and came to England as a Huguenot refugee. And as a librarian, he translated French Huguenot literature into English and English Puritan literature into French, and it may seem small and insignificant that Vernoy cited many Calvinist authors in nomenclature. However, by doing so, he directed readers to find books on this theology, perhaps persuading his audience to adopt a Calvinist stance. If they didn't completely adopt his ideology, they may have at least incorporated some of his beliefs into their outlooks. Not only did Vernoy use blanks when composing nomenclature, but many of the catalog's owners followed his lead and inserted blanks into their own books onto which they wrote references to ones that the librarian hadn't included. So the first edition of nomenclature was in 1635, and it seems to have had a pretty small print run. I have only found a couple of copies of it, and I think there's only one on early English books online. Um, and in contrast, the 1642 was a massive hit, so it's no accident that all of the interleaved books are from this edition. And there are so many copies of this edition, and I found them all over the Bodleian and the British Library. There are records of it all over North America. And I found 12 interleaved copies at Oxford, which have binders blanks. So all 12 have the same format, which is that the owner took a copy of the printed nomenclature and inserted blank folios. So on the left here, we see Vernoy's printed catalog for Proverbs 23 through 26. And across from it on a blank, the owner referenced a sermon by 
Robert Sanderson for chapter 24. And this is not an author who Vernoy had included, but the book's owner wished to record. So he put it on the blank directly across from the printed page, making the blank an extension of the printed page. The act of using binders blanks within nomenclature allowed these patrons to act as amateur librarians. They did not own the books which they were listing, they just found them at the Bodleian and they were collating them because they had read them or wanted to read them and consult them again. So this personalized the impersonal library, allowing readers to create a corpus of books they would have chosen if they had owned a private library. Creators viewed this format as enabling an active, painless, and iterative process through which they could turn nomenclator's fixed contents into a mutable book. So on one blank in a catalog with binders blanks, a delighted owner says in Latin, it is easy to add books with this, with these endeavors. Because all of these interleaved copies of nomenclator were made by different people, the contents were idiosyncratic to the taste of their owners. So we can look into who these owners were. So you could, they could be students at the university who could use the catalog as a part of their theological education. And the library was also accessible to alumni who could use it for their own personal Bible studies. And preachers, which I think this is the most interesting case, that preachers could also use it to find others' commentary to help them write a, a sermon about a particular passage for their own sermons. So nomenclator is in a duodecimo format, which is incredibly small, and they're super cute and little. If you saw before, but my hand is already very little, but you can see in comparison. Um, and so because they're so little, it enables them to be carried around the library very easily when trying to find your chosen book. Print is a static medium, so the contents of nomenclator can only reflect the books in the library at the time of publication in 1642. And the library obviously continued to grow after 1642. However, patrons needed to maintain the usability of nomenclator after its publication. So the book did not become completely obsolete, but they also had to manage the additions of books while maintaining Vernoy's organization. So owners used the blank to reference books, newer books, and formatted them into Vernoy's biblical passage organization. So here on the left, I've highlighted that one owner inserted books from 1657, 1657, 1660, 1658, 1653, and 1656. So all published after nomenclator's first publication in 1642. Because binders blanks allowed owners to customize their reading experience, we can gain insight into their personal theology. So Vernoy's Calvinist leanings appealed to readers who could use the folios to add new Puritan books and update them to reflect new publications in the theology. So here, we see that one owner cited Robert Sanderson, who's a Calvinist bishop, and Robert S and uh, Sanderson was publishing until his death in 1663. So it was possibly happening here is that the owner was inserting a sermon that was published between 1642 and 1663 and just wanted to keep it updated with new Puritan literature. Some readers' theologies are not so straightforward. So by looking at the reference authors, we can see how owners read across the confessional divide. So there was dramatic religious strife in 17th century England, and there were conflicts between Puritans and anti-Calvinist Protestants in class and Catholics, all of which resulted in a civil war. And it's obviously much more complicated than that. But there is, an, there is often an impetus for modern scholars to shoehorn British people into distinct theological categories, but these readers paint a more nuanced picture. So one owner read both Puritan and anti-Puritan literature. So on the left, we see that he cited 4 Samuel 12, 
when Samuel reminds the Israelites of God's devotion, the owner cites Robert Sanderson, whom we saw before, who was a Calvinist. And on the right for Matthew 27, when Judas hangs himself, the owner cited Jeremy Taylor, who's an anti-Protestant preacher. Despite the radical differences between these two men, the owner kept an open mind or at least wanted to know what the other side had to say. Bernoulli intended for nomenclature to be used at the Bodleian, but it could be also utilized outside of the Bodleian as a reading list, as one man Clark did. So using nomenclature can be thought of as having a two-part process, which is the first is the intellectual act of reading the Bible and then reading nomenclature, and then is the physical act of actually finding the book in the library. But Clark did not need to do the physical act to still find nomenclature useful. He could just do the intellectual act of reading the Bible and then using nomenclature. So it would just serve as a list of sermons relevant to different biblical passages, completely divorced from the use at the Bodleian. So like other users, Clark wrote the names of authors published after 1642 on his blanks. So for Nehemiah chapter 519, when Nehemiah, who's governor of Jerusalem, asks God to remember him for what he's done for the Israelites, Clark cites William Gouge, I believe it's pronounced, who died in 1653. So this book could have been published after Nomenclator 1642 publication. So the information that Clark provides has absolutely nothing to do with finding the book in the Bodleian. So he writes that it's verse 19, the name of the author, the size of the book, and the page number in the sermon. So the size of so he doesn't need to include a shelf mark because he doesn't care where it is in the library because he's not using it in the library. The owners who inserted blanks into the Bodleian versions merely updated nomenclature with its intended framework for use with, with their own specifications, whereas Clark made it into a mutable book and a bespoke bibliography wholly distinct and customized from its original intention. Institutions also interleaved binders blanks into their printed catalogs to update them. So this is from Hartford, which is an Oxford college, and they own a copy of nomenclature that says it was a supplemento to the Bodleian and that it lists books that were present in their college library, but not in the Bodleian. Like the private owners of nomenclature, the Hartford librarians wrote the names of books not included by Vernoy on the bent on the blanks across from the printed page. So these were books that were present at Hartford, but not present at the Bodleian. So here for Genesis 18, which is Sarah finding out that she will have a child, even though she's very old, a librarian wrote that Hartford owned a book by Mallory, which is present at their library, but presumably not at the Bodleian. And because Hartford's library was insufficient to satisfy someone's complete reading needs, it would still be necessary to go to the Bodleian. Hartford, Hartford's library was founded in 1642, coinciding with nomenclature's publication, but it had a much smaller library than the central one. By listing the books Hartford owned on the blanks, the catalog, a cataloger encouraged the reader to consult the college's new library before seeking out literature at the Bodleian. So on the blank, we can see that Hartford's shelf marks are different than the printed ones in nomenclature. So they were clearly four different collections. And this copy can be considered a proto catalog for Hartford's burgeoning collection. <laughs> and the books in Hartford's version go up to 1661, which is unsurprising because that is the same year that Hartford published their own printed catalog, making one that's reliant on the Bodleian unnecessary. This system of using binders blanks for citations, which had been pioneered by Vernoy and used at Hartford, was later adopted for cataloging at Wadham College, Oxford. In the college's library, there are four books in the Bibliotheca series, which means bibliographies, which date from the early 17th century. 
So in 1680s, Philip Stubbs, the college's librarian, interleaved links into the catalog. Bibliotheca had an entirely different format than nomenclator. It's a generalized bibliography designed to help readers find books on any theme from hairstyles to boils to cheeses, and it's not for use in a particular library. So here on the right, we see in Bibliotheca a list of books published about the English church. So Stubbs, the librarian, amended Bibliotheca to conform to Wadden's needs. So because Georg Dradius, Bibliotheca's creator, included every book he could possibly find, only a small fraction of these were actually present in Wadham, so next to the books which Wadham actually owned on the right, we can see the shelf marks of the books that were present in Wadham. Stubbs and later librarians used the binders blanks to keep track of these new books. So see on the left, he added the authors of new books like the history of the Reformation in three volumes from 1715. So you see it was used well into the 18th century. So Bibliotheca is a general static bibliography, but with the blanks, it is transformed into an institutionally specific mutable catalog. So I presented a lot of intricacies about how individual readers and librarians interacted with binders blanks and library catalogs, but still I also think that we can use them as an avenue to discuss the role of authority in early modern reading. When he published Nomenclator, Vernoy became an authority figure and readers entrusted him to shepherd them within the, li the labyrinth of the library. So he may have taken advantage of that trust when he directed them to read Calvinist literature. Nevertheless, through the Bosleyan sponsorship of the catalog, the library assured nomenclator, nomenclator's owners that Vernoy could be trusted and that he was an expert. And when patrons interleaved binders blanks into their own books and wrote their own references, they became librarians of their own collections whose references were as valuable and authoritative as Vernoy's. The relationship between the nomenclators with binders blanks and their owners is essential for the study of hybrid books. Print is a mass media platform that makes information accessible to the public, and manuscripts for an audience of one are customizable and idiosyncratic to the person who made them, personalizing the impersonal. The 17th century Bodleian should not be considered accessible to the reading public, Readers still had to be associated with the university in some capacity to go there, which entailed status, wealth, education, and maleness. Although this point of entry excluded most of the population, there had never been such an extensive knowledge repository in the Anglican world, in the Anglophone world. Many of the books I study focus on more generic, broader trends and are emblematic of how people customized a particular, particular genre of book, like a book of hours or breviary, but library catalogs at Oxford are a different dynamic. They begin as a standardized, all-encompassing all -encompassing corpus of knowledge. And over time, their obsolescences can only be prevented by becoming hybrid books with the handwritten interventions of those who go to the library. Thank you for that. Really fascinating. Oh, thanks, Eric. Floor is open for questions. And... Okay. Liliana, what's I mean, I was going to call on someone else. <laughs> Go ahead, Liliana. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for uh, the short presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, this is, of course, a very strange piece for me. And I'm just wondering about the relationship of cataloging and reading. Yeah. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about other books that have found this plans. Yeah. Is it something that is just the invention of the catalogs? Or are there other books that are then appearing uh, to make notes? 
Well, thank you. That is actually a perfect question for me because that is what <laughs> the entire chapter of my dissertation that this comes from. So I talk in my chapter about a lot of different genres of binders blanks. And basically I argue that they can be used to amend any printed text in various ways. So other ways I've used them have been um, looking at them when they're inserted into Bibles. And so in that instance, people are also using them for references. So that's a similar instance, but I've also found instances of using them for translation. So on one side of the printed page, you have a text in a foreign language and then someone translates it on the blank. And I think the most familiar genre that most people deal with frequently are almanacs. So people using them to amend the calendar in the almanac or to put their own farmering, boring farming information. Um, but there are a lot of different genres and they're really, really common in early modern Britain. And I think they're really common all over Europe, but I don't work in countries outside of England, France, and the Netherlands, so I haven't had an opportunity to look at them outside of this. Thank you so much, Lila. That was amazing. Oh, um, my question was about the actual size of the binders blank compared to the size of the notation. In most of the books, you know, it seems like there was marginal space on the printed page where there wasn't that much actual writing on the binders blank. Yeah. It, it seems like you could use the margin to write the information that you needed. So I'm just wondering if you found any reason why, or are there some of them that just weren't pictured that have like lists and lists and lists to where it's like, not feasible that the margins would provide enough space for that or yeah so i've seen both um so there are definitely versions of nomenclator that have full blanks that have lots and lots of sermons and on the side in the margins also have references to other books but i think one of the benefits of using blanks is that it's neat it's clean so you can very obviously see this sermon that is for Proverbs 3 that this person wants to add correspond to the printed page of Proverbs 3. Whereas I think if you have them as marginalia, it gets kind of messy mm -hmm. and you can't really write long things. You can only write little short things. Um, so there's no reason you can't do it. And I've definitely seen it. And they, let me see. I mean, I definitely have instances where they do it. I just think that it's not as neat and clean and visually appealing as when you use the blanks. Thank you. I, you know, I didn't know about nomenclator at all. <laughs> Great stuff. But I have a couple of related questions, I think. Um, one, starting with your negative comparison of the 1605 and 1620 catalog to nomenclator. Yeah. The 1605 and 1620 catalogs enable you, if you want to find the book by Thomas Brown or something by Thomas Brown, you look up Brown and you can find it. Nomenclator doesn't let you search by author at all. So it seems to me it's serving a very different function. And I'm wondering, and you know, so correct me why this is not the right way to be thinking about it. If if to think of nomenclator as a library catalog is kind of a red herring, um, especially if you think about that 1642 edition that is exists in many, many copies, you said, and think about somebody like Clark who isn't present at Oxford, right? Um, but what the nomenclator is, is it seems to me the kind of book that that any any cleric, any, any divine would need to have on his desk because he's preparing sermons every week. Yeah. Um, he, is and he's always a he. He knows that he wants to have a riff on on a on a, a certain passage in Ezekiel. And what nomenclator allows him to do is he goes to that precise passage of Ezekiel. He finds out who who else in the sermon literature has riffed on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he can go to that no matter where he is. So it's not not in Oxford. Plus he's like a smart divine, and he knows about some sermons on Ezekiel that. That they know I did not know about either because they didn't have access or because they they hadn't been published in, in 1642. So so your your country parson has a way to to constantly update this amazing database of 
of certain literature. So it's, in some ways, it's a much more essential book than a catalog of, of the Bodleian would be. And it's really the kind of book that nobody who's, who's writing a sermon could do without. Um, so I'm wondering if that, if that makes sense as a kind of alternative way of, of looking at it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, Thank you. I think that that is really constructive and really helpful. Um, I mean, I think what you're talking about, Clark is doing it in that way. And obviously, I don't know who Clark is. It's just <laughs> I have an attribution on the title page that says this man's name is Clark, but he could very easily have been a preacher using it to write sermons. And you're right, it does seem like a text that would be essential to writing sermons. And it's surprising that there aren't more copies in that sense, and that this isn't more of a diffuse book. But I, I don't mean to suggest that the Thomas James catalogs aren't important. They are important. I just think that they have their limitations and that nomenclator is filling in lacunae that uh, the Thomas James books leave open. Yeah, we'll, go to, we'll keep going around, but I just would add that, that the only bit of the book that, well, it doesn't run counter to what you're saying, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Is the shelf life? I mean, in other words, you could have made you you could have and other people yeah. did make books like that without yeah. shelf life. So it's, it's weird. The, the printed part itself seems a little bit hybrid, not in the way you're talking about, but it's kind of trying to do two things right. at once. And you would need something like that for like a whole range of subjects of books in the Bodleian to make it. You know, so, you, you want one on other topics, and yeah. that's kind of important. So. Yeah, obviously, as I said, it's that double act. It's the intellectual act of reading it and reading the Bible and reading nomenclator. And that's what Clark is doing. And that's where you could use it for sermons, like what Jerry was saying. And it's the second act, the physical act of going into the Bodleian. And that's not necessary for using it completely. And I should, should add that I didn't really add this because my presentation is mostly focused on the 17th century. But in the 18th century, it was really adopted for other genres. So there are scientific books that are also made for use at the Bodleian in the same format where you look up, I don't know, you want to learn about plants. And so you look up key for plants and it gives you lots of books about plants that are in. There's one that I found that's for Jesus College specifically that does that. Peter? Sure. Um, I wanted to ask kind of two interrelated questions about you, because you kept emphasizing the idea of customization. So, and if I'm not mistaken, the language you were using was putting like the agency of adding binders links into like the book owner yeah. or the customer. So like, was there not a market where binders were doing this or how do we know if this is what they're using? Because when I looked at the pictures, I would never have guessed that was something people would be doing on their own. And then the second question I have is like, maybe kind of a process question, just out of curiosity of, because these were so much personal to just people's own reading practices, like how did you go about like finding a systematic like, sample of these to study for, for a problem? How did they end up in the library? Yeah, and how did they end up in the library? Um, you know? I'll, I'll do the second question first, because that's a shorter answer. And the first question that you asked actually has a pretty extensive answer. Oh. And I have photos to actually answer the first question, but I don't know how they ended up at the Bodley. And there's one book that I have looked at that has like a little provenance tag and that it just says that it was sold in the 19th century and then added to the Bodleian collection. But that's the only instance of provenance that I have. But what you're talking about, about finding them, that is really an integral part of my dissertation is how to find hybrid books because, you know, classically in the 19th century, librarians try and extricate print and manuscript, and there isn't really a lot of, you know, wanting to recognize an overlap. And so they're often not cataloged very well. And I found this with everything. And so when I look for books that fit in my dissertation with the hybridity, I've had to use certain key terms and learn certain words to use in searches. So Penn is actually wonderfully unique in that the library uses the term hybrid book. But like at Oxford, when I was doing research, I had to do interleaved, MS 
print, manuscript print, but actually I was talking to a really lovely librarian at Bodley and, and he found a card catalog for me that was completely hybrid books. And that was really exciting. Uh, and I actually had someone else obsessed before you. <laughs> so it was made in the 1970s. And embarrassingly, that was the first and only time I've ever used a card catalog. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had to rely on one before. So it is a little embarrassing. But to answer your first question, and that is actually a very complicated question about um how do we know that these were inserted by users and not by the um the binders or the booksellers so um we don't have a lot of information let me show you some pictures actually that's the easiest way to do it okay how do i can i share again yeah um, so obviously we don't have a lot of information about the binding industry before the 18th century. So a lot of the information and knowledge that we have is based off of material evidence. And so I kind of had to come across it in a, in a material bibliographic way rather than a documentary way. And so we do have instances of publishers selling books with blanks ahead of time. So that in the specific case for that is Almanac. We find that a lot for Almanac. But I think what's happening, well, so Peter Salesreth has talked a lot about how there's a fallacy that all books were sold unbound by publishers and sometimes books were sold bound. So in theory, the books could be sold bound with the binders blanks by the publisher. But I don't really think that that's what's going on here. And there is also, I've heard talk of publishers holding on to stacks of unbound books. But that doesn't really make sense. And then for sale later, but that doesn't really make sense for me in this instance either because you wouldn't hold on to a book for a really long time it's going to become obsolete so if you're printing a book in 1642 you're not going to hold it until 1649 because you know it's obsolete by 1649. so then when we're talking about binaries things become a little complicated so all of the copies of nomenclator that i found across you know all of the ones i've looked at in oxford and at the British Library, they all have different bindings, which to me suggests that they're from different binderies or different publishers. The only commonality is that some of them have Lindvelm bindings, which is the one in the middle, and that's an incredibly common binding that was used from the 16th century to the 18th, or I think even right to the 18th century. Yeah, so it's incredibly common. That's not indicative of any particular publishing house. But I think if they're coming from the same publisher or the same binder and they're made generically already with the binders blanks in them, they would have the same binding. But even if they're coming from the same binder, <laughs> um, so even if they're coming from the same binder and customers choosing different binding that still implies a level of customer consumer intervention and there were tons and tons of binders in oxford from the middle ages to yes oh yes okay i want to make sure that yeah. we keep our order a little bit Unless there's a follow-up. Follow okay. okay, follow-up because I, it's a question about have you the paper that's being used as well and yeah. compare the paper. So is, I'm glad you that said is, that that is yeah. So I have looked at a lot of watermarks on the blanks and I made sure okay. to look at the watermarks and all of the blanks, and none of them have the same watermark. And so you can see here these are both. Heather Wolf has worked on Heather Wolf, friend of the seminar and recent uh, 
recent presenter is working on top paper and paper in early modern Britain. And so a really common source of paper is from Normandy and there are these little flower pots and these are a common motif on the binder's legs. But if you look at the little handle, the handle of the one on the left is kind of like this and the one on the right is curly. And so to me, if they were coming from the same binder, they would likely have the same paper, which is possible, but not necessarily definitive. One's printed on though, and the other is just blank paper. And that's, that would be a difference. I mean, if you're talking about the blank paper all being different, it's one thing. I wouldn't expect the paper to match. Yeah, paper Sorry, that's yeah. probably, a, to be honest, it is, as I'm sure all of you know, it is very hard to take pictures of watermarks yeah. Yeah. by yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's logistically very yeah. challenging. And there was a really mean librarian yeah. in the Bosnian. <laughs> and when I asked him if he would hold open uh, and hold uh, up the blank so I could take a photo and like shine a light from my camera. He refused and said, that's not my job. <laughs> so I actually don't have as many photos as I would like to show you, but you have to take my word for it that none of them are the same. So but none of, none of the none paper of that's been interleaved versus, I wouldn't expect, I mean, the other paper that no. printed on is totally different. Yeah, sorry, that's yeah. a bad example, but yeah. yes, yeah. none of the, none of the blanks are the same and there's a watermark database and it's enormous yeah, yeah. and i've tried it, it's so hard That's to hard. find things because like especially with something like this with pot paper there are so many and they yeah. all like how do you differentiate that the one on the left has like the this handle whereas the one on the right has the curlicue handle it's hard to look in the database and find that and so how do you know where the source of these is within this massive? But it's, I think it's a little bit of a flux dichotomy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No one's doing this at home. I mean, it's yeah. being done by a binder regardless. Absolutely. Like taking, yeah. So it is it's not saying, itself, it would be right. interesting to know whether they were ever sold like pre bound That's what with it, yeah. the blanks. But, you know, I'd be surprised if they weren't. I mean, once a bind, once a bookseller sees someone asking this a few times, there's not a big difference. I think theoretically between doing one or two on spec yeah. and then, you that know, and I think yeah. a lot of books were purchased so you'd go and say, oh, I want a nomenclator. Mm -hmm. I'll come back in two days. Can you interleave it? Yeah. You know, so. so I actually, because I found so many of these, I would expect to find more that were blank. I only found one that was blank. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So if that was really a common market practice of actually selling them pre-bound, I would expect to find more than just this one blank one. And this is actually the one that has the provenance in it. Mm -hmm. All right. well, We've got to move on. I've got so many questions. I don't know. Two in the chat. Yeah. Well, <laughs> finally, well, there's sorry. so many questions that could be asked. Such a yeah. fascinating topic oh, for you. information management and so forth. Yeah. But quite, some of my questions are very directly related to these other ones. So, I mean, how many copies of the nomenclator, first of all, have you looked at it? Are they all with some kind of interleaving, or is it just a fraction thereof when they all have yeah. the uh, interleaving? Is it after every page, or is it just inserted at, at certain points also? How many of these are, do you know the owner? Well, yeah. That, of course, speaks to the question, clearly these are books for divine, for practical use, and uh, adding to bring them up to date to, to prepare sermons. And from that point of view, too, uh, it seems to me the fact that you may not find too many of the 16, did you the first edition, 20? 35. Uh, 35 in libraries. These are not the sort of books that ultimately are going to go to a library because they yeah. are such practical things for one's own use. Uh, and there, there may have been more of them. But insofar as you have the names of owners, all clerics, mm -hmm. they, and library, uh, it's fascinating that it would be in a college library as well. Clearly, that's another useful place so that you can send the students 
to go yeah. through the Bible and to find the book. But, uh, so those are all questions that I've thought about a lot. So first, the, the factual questions you were asking, which is, I have looked at probably like 30 different copies of nomenclator from 1642 across Oxford and the British Library. And there are a bunch on early English books online that I've also looked at. So you can see those. Obviously, you don't have the tactile version, but you can see the you know, title page if there's an owner. And unfortunately, the only owner that I know of is Clark. And then um, for the Hartford one, it says that it was donated by Hartford Library founder uh, Henry Wilkinson, I believe is his name. Um, and so obviously that is a pretty obvious connection. But um, there are 12, I found 12 interleaved nomenclators and they've all been at Oxford. But you're right, it is, it, it is sort of like a weird thing because it, they're not quite ephemeral, but they are sort of ephemeral. It, it's not sort of a highbrow book that you think someone would donate back into the library. So it's hard to tell what the circulation would have actually been. And so obviously this is just a snapshot and, you know, much like anything else with bibliography, we're going with what we got. Um, but 12 out of 30 is a very high proportion of it. Really, yeah, that's, that, that's a very, that's right. striking. Yeah, Liliana, yeah. and then we have two well, questions in the chat. Well, to your question and my wondering how they ended up in Oxford, at Oxford yeah. again, I wonder, and I say this cautiously, whether we are not looking at the wrong place. Um, if these are Oxford graduates who were using it and studying with it, how about going to the private libraries? Sure. Or aristocrats or uh, uh, preachers who were at Oxford, then you know who they are. Then you can find out about the way they studied and how they used it directly in their work. And I would say, naively speaking, you will find many more in those places than recycling back to Oxford, like the ones that was bought in the 19th century. Liliana, I would love to do that. And with, if you would like to fund me <laughs> to go to those private libraries and check it out and pay for my trip to the UK and to have yeah. aristocrats open their libraries, <laughs> I would love to do it. But you, you don't necessarily have to travel. You can, first of all, send letters of inquiry. Sure, yeah. And find absolutely. out what there is. And I'm sure that a private person will be if one is lucky, so happy <laughs> yeah. that sure. somebody is interested in this and, and interested in the way and... And, and without being too started. circular, you might find some library catalogs of private libraries <laughs> that yeah, might that mention library, this, this library catalog. Also, I mean, Hold on. look on OCLC to see yeah. where copies of, yeah. of yeah. the nomenclature are. <laughs> I don't think they're likely to be an aristocratic library. I think that's way too elevated for this book. You know, it's like a middle brow book that's, that's going to end up... Lot. It's going to end up yeah. in a library with a whole bunch of books from the local maker. Those are very hard to find in my yeah. opinion. That's just such a it's, it's a it's a hard genre. It's yeah, it's a hard genre in terms of survival to replicate. Also, yeah. we can visit up there in Cambridge. <laughs> As is once again, someone would like to send <laughs> us Cambridge, and I don't. I mean, I so. A, a question that I have actually that if someone would like to help me investigate, that would be great, which is I only had the chance to go to Oxford because of my limited graduate student funds. Um, but I would love to know if this is also happening at Cambridge, although Cambridge didn't have sort of an equivalent to the Bodleian. But what's really interesting to me, which would be a really interesting thing to find out, is that. Bodley, when he founded the Bodleian, was copying continental libraries. So he had gone to national libraries in France and Spain, and he had gone to the Vatican Library, and he said, wow, these are really great big libraries. We should have a Protestant one in England. 
And so it's striking to me that a lot of those big libraries would have similar informational management problems. And so I wouldn't be surprised if they're using the same techniques as in the Bodleian. So if someone else would like to mm -hmm. address that, get back to you. Want to read in a couple questions? Or yes. Hands so, up in the chat? I forgot to tell them to put their hands up. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, they've been typing them in. Um, so uh, one question was posed here as well. So that was answered. Um, but then Carly asked, um, can you please ask Lila whether we have any more biographical information on Renoid? Seems like a very interesting person. <laughs> yeah, we, we know a fair bit of, about him. So we know that he was born in France and that he got a master's degree at a Huguenot University in France. And then he fled to England and he became the second sub librarian at Oxford. So his position was that he was the sub librarian. So Thomas James was the big librarian, he was the sub librarian. Uh, and we know that he married an English woman and that he was part of a local parish. Um, we also know there's a record from an alumnus who's like some very wealthy alumnus who continued to use the library after he graduated. And he wrote this long letter of recommendation about Vernoy in which he says, I was so stuck and I don't know any foreign languages and I need to read books in Dutch and I need to read books in German and Latin and French and he helped me, he sat with me diligently and he translated all of the books with me. Isn't he a wonderful library? It's just like a prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ready to go. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this raises so many really wonderful questions and thank you for this presentation. Um, I was just wondering of the nomenclator that you, of the 12 that you have, um, uh, are there any where there's more than one hand? Like, are there yes. all like one? There are. Okay. So yeah. Just one person. That is a great question. There are some that have been inherited and that have more than one hand in them. Um, and that would be sort of another level. I already had too much going on, but that would be another level. And so, yeah, you can see it being useful across generations, which is really interesting that someone would say something that's already been customized. I'm interested in seeing all the custom things and making it custom to myself. And that you keep that. Like, I don't know, you know, I'm thinking about when I, you know, when I was an undergrad and I would rent textbooks and someone would have already yeah. written in the margins, that was a really big turnoff to me. <laughs> but clearly some people didn't mind that when they, or they may have appreciated it. I mean, that I was gonna ask the same thing actually, because I think if I unless I misheard you, at one point you were talking about you know Vernoy's authoritative printed catalog, but yeah. then I think you said something that the manuscript editions became as valuable and as authoritative as Vernoy's. And I was thinking, well, how, how would we know that? Like, what kind of evidence might we, how do we know? Or did people distinguish between the print and that? And I think, you know, comp manuscript editions to someone else's manuscript edition does suggest that they were viewed as authoritative because you could equally see someone thinking, well, I trust Vernoy, you know, it's printed or whatever, you know, but I don't trust the manuscript editions. So I think, I, that's really good evidence, I yeah. think, for the for for your point that yeah. the manuscript and print are not viewed as really radically epistemologically different. Yeah. But I would think that a very likely scenario would be, you know, frequently were multiple generations of clerics in the yeah. same family. Yeah. So it could easily be the father passing on to the son, who we know is also destined for. The clergy. It could be, but it, I would also be interested on these books of looking for any marks of secondhand sale, oh, yeah. because I think it's not, there are, and I don't have them in mind, but there are cases of secondhand sale, like an auction record, a bit, bit later, but making clear that they have the notes of so-and-so in them, that even at the 17th century. So I wonder if, yeah. you know, we, if you could trace them outside of family, it's almost more interesting, right, that someone would want Right. some other person's annotation. So I did this research last summer and then the winter before that. And then I went to RSA in the last month, the Renaissance Society of America conference in the last month. And I went to a really, really good talk about the secondhand book market in England. And one of the things that they were talking about were these like 
symbol that books are always used, and I didn't know that until now. And so I wish I had you known know, that. There might be something, yeah. some, and they're like little. They'll be like a letter V or something, or like a dot that means this is sold for one pence or something like that. Uh, and so I wish I had known that at the time. And I think that if we, if I had known that, that that would have been really telling to investigate secondhand sales, but. Um, yeah, the only real provenance mark I found is that one little blur, but that was from the 19th century, and it was from an auction house. I don't know how interesting that is for our purposes. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much. It's so much fun. I uh, okay. Fun fact: um, we could take books from our reference department, where we are still annotating printed copies no. of things with relevant library information. The SBC is in most libraries, the paper SBC is annotated. Yeah. No. And, uh, and that is a practice that some old fogies uh, sitting like the two of us continue uh, because it has a certain kind of utility that you cannot replicate in another way. That is to say a sort of standard thing that needs to be customized. Um, that was one of the questions, but I just thought it was a fun fact. I can show you those later. but. Yeah. I love this project because it seems to me, I don't know if you agree with this sort of, there's a kind of longer term practice that you're investigating, interleaving. That doesn't really seem to have a history or not a, not one that I know. Binders, blanks, that, you know, those kind of connected, but long term. The, yeah, things that could be studied over time on the one hand and putting it next to something that seems, and this is what I'd like you to maybe even talk a little more about, something that seems historically precise, and that's to say it's deployed at a certain point of time in a certain moment of intense uh, need. And, you know, England in the 1640s, titanic moment of religious political controversy. So would you say, and a Huguenot, I mean, we have a sort of, you know, you alluded to the, the complex religious politics. Yeah. Here. So, you know, I want to make your project that would you agree to a sort of like, you know, um, material practice being deployed in a, in a particularly explosive moment. And uh, do you sort of agree? Is that something that you want to go so far as to say? And, uh, you know, we really need our sermons to be, uh, uh, you know, it's 1642. It's six. Yeah, it that's doesn't, true. That's, right? that's definitely true. But it's also, I'm sorry that I didn't give as probably good of a uh, description of 17th century English. No, we don't have those. Yeah, we can't. I don't, think, I don't think we have the time to right. really go into the intricacies of the Civil War, but definitely. And I think one of the really interesting things about Vernoy is that he is a Huguenot, and we think of Oxford during the Civil War as being a royalist stronghold. I mean, Charles is based right. in Oxford, so it is like, and we think of Cambridge as being sort of low church and Oxford as being high church, so it does have that interesting dynamic. The problem with sort of putting a locus of these books during the Civil War is that I just, we don't know when the books were annotated, and so we can't definitively say, like, this book was annotated in Oxford when Charles yeah. was based in Oxford. It's hard to make those sorts of statements. And I think a lot of the other books I've been looking at, I don't think sort of the other genres I've been looking at also don't really have dates like that. There's one that I've been looking at that's a translation of Welsh Shams into English, and that was really interesting. And that's from the 1590s. That's obviously like well before any of this, but I'm sorry. I no, 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 I think I appreciate that cautious end. Some, some of them some of them are late. Some of them are adding books in the 1660s. Yeah. So it's obviously like past yeah, that moment. Yeah. That's also mm -hmm. interesting about, you know, the impetus for creating the printed book may, ha may be in one moment, but of course the books outlast that moment. Yeah. And you read, you know, there are the people who are happy to add you know, um, Puritan and Arminian both, and you know, and you read them as maybe ecumenical, although I think one of the interesting things about that practice is that that same evidence could be there for someone who is preparing to write something that's really ecumenical, but it's also a highly polemical practice. Yeah. So, you know, you could end up with the most vitriolic. Oh, 
Oh yeah. And so, but you have to have read, you have to know where to go read them and to quote them. That's how all those polemics yeah. work. So you said that too, which is I yeah. know, like it can be both reading across the divide because you're interested yeah. or, or to because attack. you want to attack. And so it does show that you have been, I mean, obviously we can't know what the intentions were right. because that's not what they're reporting. They're just reporting what they were reading, not their feelings towards what they were reading. Yeah. But but it's interesting to me that the practice, the material practice is like identical. The outcome is yes. <laughs> radically different, you know, but they're they're all learning to do this same cross-referencing technique yes. in the interleaving. You know? It goes beyond theology, if I understood you correctly. Beyond yeah, the what? It goes beyond theology. Oh, yeah, it, theology. It yeah. On. So it's even secularizing yeah. Yeah. in an odd way. But that's not until the 18th century. For the 17th century, the all of the books I found are in this theological model, or they're in the Bibliotheca one, which is like a slightly different practice that's less sort of the turning a library catalog into a personal library catalog that is the like generalized bibliography into uh the library but i just think that's sort of an in that's it's it's very much a different phenomenon i just think it's an interesting phenomenon that uh bottom did that i just want to push out an idea i think maybe it's always crazy but I mean, to what extent could this be part of the educational? I mean, that that the people who were being trained had these because they were at Oxford and they were using them there as part of their education. Yeah. I mean, it strikes me that that might be, you know, a place. You know, it's like you, you know, the reason why some are interleaved because you've got some more zealous students and you've got other yeah. students who will use it, but maybe not in the same way. But that it might have been part, you know, like. You know, everyone's required to yeah. buy so we, a book or yeah. use a book in the library. I don't know if they, you know, multiple copies already in the library that people were yeah. using or however it was being used. But thinking of it as part of that educational process for theologians. Yeah, I mean, I I think when I talked about the three users whom I imagined using it are either the student, the alumnus, or the preacher. Um, obviously, I don't know, but the only but to be introduced as a student, right? And um, then you would carry it through, and then they absolutely take it with you. It definitely, it absolutely was not used as a guide to be kept at the library. Right. And right. in in the introduction to nomenclature, Bernoit states that this is for people to carry around with them when they're using it in the library. Uh, and but he doesn't really talk about an audience he just says this is for patrons of the library so i think we have to imagine who these people were but i think those are really the three categories of people if you sort of think of both the exercise of going to the library who are the people who are going to the library the students and alumni and then who are the people who are using it in that way that divorce that is divorced from the physical and is just the intellectual and i think that really would be preachers but there's there's i mean of course people who are not preachers could also like clark we don't know who clark was clark could very easily have just been a normal guy who was not a student or not an alumnus and not a preacher but just wanted to read in this very specific yes, yeah. theological yeah. way yeah. so I mean, that way it's kind of odd that Bernoy doesn't say something about that in the preface. Yeah. He can only imagine the users being people walking around the bottom. Yeah, the, yeah. the book seems obviously easily adaptable to anyone yeah. who wants to read the Bible closely. Yeah. And, but he's sort of well, it's stuck like in this yeah. world yeah. that Oxford yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can't good. get out of his walls. He's missed the main market. <laughs> <for this time. laughs> he needs to justify his time for some yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. Like, this also, you know. He might have been told to make this switch. Like he, right. he is a librarian. He's he's it not. Does, it does seem like an yeah, element of tradition to He's it. not the librarian like James. He's the sub librarian. And we there are books. There are instant later he remakes the 1605-1620 catalog and he says that he actually remakes it and adds the books to it mm -hmm. so he's doing that too um 
And so we know he's sort of taking over from what Thomas James had started. But, mm -hmm. you know, his duty wasn't to write sure. a book that's a research tool for a general populace. He's a librarian, so he's staked with writing library catalogs. That's but I think one thing that what you're suggesting, even with that answer and before, is that you could argue even more that some of these librarians, these sort of scholar librarians you're looking at, are pretty well trained in the practice yes. of manuscript responding to print. That's what they're doing in their workplace. That's the way it's so they're 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 thinking hybridistically. Um, <laughs> Can I use that term? Do it. it yes, <laughs> won't help you much, but um, uh, as a, as a as a reading practice, as a maybe more so than some others would. Yeah. Time for a couple more. Yeah. Uh, two questions. One uh, very specific about things I know a lot about, like the need for some further insight, uh, which is just uh, where is Bernard from? What yeah. academy has he gone to, and when did he come to be? And then, much more general, is there a history of? Catalogs and cataloging library having there must be somewhere. There is an undone book. There is not. <laughs> which is oh, really? to say massive job. I massive. And, which is, you know, I thought about this and I thought about like if I could start my dissertation over again, knowing what I know now, that is actually the topic that I would have so, wanted to do. So and there's a popular press book out there. Mm -hmm. that's like the footnote. Yeah, yeah, yeah but this is hard. that would be a good I topic. think and we collect these there 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 are hundreds it's a huge it's a pretty huge it's a pretty serious job believe it or not there are not as many books on the Bodleian academic press mm -hmm. books on the Bodleian as you would think there are there are a lot of what I found they're like books that are meant for the gift shop yeah. at the Bodleian yeah. about the history of the Bodleian. People like to give us those when they go. Like, yeah, I mean, like, they're not. Which we like. <laughs> um, I forget more of Vernoy's bibliographic or biographic information, but I have a whole document about who he was, and I can absolutely send it to you. I forget which college it was and what years he was in France and when he took it. So I can get back to you on that. I mean, in, in the history of catalogs, I, mean, I, I would want to take issue with something that slipped in earlier that, you know, before the age of print, you didn't keep a library catalog. And we do have lists of books in individual monastic libraries going back to the 12th century or so. And with they, shelf marks. Some yeah. Kind of shelf yeah. Marks. I mean, they, 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 did, they did catalog their books. They knew where to find them in their, in their manuscript libraries. Um, so I... I haven't seen any that has had shelf marks that are medieval, and I've there aren't actually that many medieval library catalogs available. There's actually um, an extensive article written by a librarian at the DL about it, um, and so there are very few surviving ones. So at least the ones I have seen that are at the British Library do not have one. When I was doing research at the Koningsleit Bibliothek in the Netherlands. This was sort of also on my radar, and I found a library catalog for a convent, for um, a convent of nuns, and it's a little book. It's, very, it's also very cute, um, and that is in the similar category of being an inventory rather than a find and read. So I haven't found ones that are find and read. If you'd like, if you found one, I'd love to see. No, but I mean, the inventory is a good catalog. Yeah, it just, I think the purpose of an inventory is different because, you know, like the 15th century one I showed you and like the convent one I'm thinking of, they're not organized in a way to help you find the book because I don't think the libraries were large enough to have complicated, like, if you look at the shelf marks in nomenclature or in any other Bodleian library, the shelf mark system is incredibly complicated. And so these medieval libraries do need to have these incredibly complicated systems with numbers. I mean, it's like they, yeah. like they didn't, you know, medieval libraries didn't need the Dewey Decimal System. 
Harry, a last question. It's not a question. I just wanted to add on to this conversation. Just that a lot of medieval library like catalogs, even if they are like inventories, a lot of them are like aspirational yeah. inventories rather than like realistic like, Absolutely. depictions of what's actually there in the library itself. Yeah. So that's okay. Well, let us conclude by thanking library. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>